Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. According to Senate.gov, on November 17th, 1800, following a 10-year stay in Philadelphia, the Senate of the Sixth Congress met for the first time in the Capitol building. This marked a momentous occasion for what many around the world probably thought would never even happen 30 years earlier. On the same date, albeit 191 years later, an injury occurred in the Silverdome, a moment that this host recalls as one of his earliest vivid memories of watching football. But just like the birth of the nation fighting through many years to ultimately walk into the Capitol building, this guest will do the opposite because one day he will walk out of Ford's Field. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is November 28th, 1991. And we're in the Pontiac Silverdome parking lot. It's a sea of vehicles all throughout the concrete. It's an emotional day. This is Thanksgiving Day. A time-honored tradition in the state of Michigan. Detroit Lions versus the Chicago Bears. Again, this is an emotional day. But it's not just emotional because of the game and Thanksgiving and everything that goes around with it, with what we're thankful for. Because there's something else that happened a week earlier. At this game, Lomas Brown gives a speech in front of the stadium and the fans around the world watching. That could be called, uh, what we'll call the thumbs up speech. It was to make sure that his buddy in the hospital knew that they were there for him. The team, the fans of the Lions, and the entire NFL organization had this week's guest back. This week's guest is Mike Utley. And that's kind of what we alluded to at the introduction about walking out of Ford's Field. But let's take us back a week before Thanksgiving. On November 17th, 1991, while playing against the Los Angeles Rams, Mike Utley fractured his sixth and seventh cervical vertebrae, and became instantly paralyzed. Now, as you will learn in this interview, Mike does not let, he did not, and he shall not let this moment define who he is. But let's take it even further back. Mike was the second ever Washington State University player to earn consensus first team All-American status. He was drafted with a third pick in the third round of the 1989 draft, and he became the starting right guard for the Detroit Lions. Now, about two and a half years later, November 17th, 1991, he sustained this injury that took him away from the game that he basically knew his whole life, his livelihood. But again, this injury did not, will not, and shall not define who Mike Utley is. Mike Utley defines who Mike Utley is by the determination and the actions that he sets forth and will continue to take until the moment that he gets up out of that chair and walks out of Ford's Field, down the road, hits Woodward Avenue, maybe goes and grabs a beer. A monumental victory over 30 years in the making. 
But instead of talking about this story and hearing me go on and on about my love for the lions to you, let's talk about my love of the lions with my gully. And let's hear from the man himself. Please welcome to the Football History Do podcast, Mike Utley. We're going to go back to basically, I mean, as we're recording this, this is almost 30 years. Let's go back to November 17th, 1991, Pontiac Silverdome. And let's describe the moment that changed your life. Well, it was just a typical play. First play of the fourth quarter. Uh, Eric Kramer gets in the huddle and barks out a, uh, a play for us and goes up to the line of scrimmage. And, you know, it it goes as well up until I, uh, you know, get pulled down and hit my head. It's, it, it's, it's football, my good man. I have no regrets. I look back and um, I knew I was in trouble when I hit and I rolled over. I am. Um, it, it was devastating. I've lost. I've had sensation burning down my legs before, but this time I lost complete strength in my my whole body, and that was that was devastating. Yeah, my. I mean, I didn't make it to the the different levels of playing that you did, but my my recollection of the only time I can think of where I I, I guess I blacked out, you could say, is my knee got hit. And I hit and I I was offensive guard as well. And I I, I was on the ground. I remember waking up kind of real quick and then thinking that everything was okay. But then it was, you know, how when the adrenaline goes and then you get off the field and you realize, oh, wait, I guess I can't walk anymore. (laughs) I mean, I mean, to the different level and everything. But uh, I was doing some research and I go back to, so there's 2014, there was a Thanksgiving video. You know, me being a Lions fan, I, I have a little special place in my heart for Thanksgiving. And we were actually, that was probably the last time we were a dominant team as far as during the regular season. And that was, I, I do remember watching the video, you know, of, of you discussing, but then there's a segment that came up. It was the, geez, about a week later after the injury with Lomas Brown speaking to you over the you know, over the crowd to in the stadium. And it, I'm going to tell you for me, because, so I was only about six and a half when this happened. And for <laughs> me, that, not to like make you feel like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. But I, I, that was probably, I don't want to say the first memory I had of football. Cause I was, I still remember some earlier, but like from a vivid, like actually something that stuck with me that out as a Lions fan and the NFL fan, that was the, the memory I can recall that was the first i mean what about you what was your first memory of football growing up well it was peewee football and it was one of those things for for me being a from a family who's you typically bigger than the average the average family um these kids i was playing against they were two years older than i and because back then you played by weight, not so much age. I don't know what the criteria now nowadays is. Um, I guess if you spell your name right, you get a ribbon and you get a trophy. But back then, it it just came down to it. And that was my first experience. And then when I got into high school, I figured out that um, these kids are my own age. And I really enjoyed, you know, from that point on to say, yes, I played basketball. I did the wrestling. I, I did soccer during, you know, the, the peewee or the grade school kind of thing. But football, I tended to gravitate to that. And rightfully so, it kind of made my niche with it. Yeah, I did a, you know, had a very successful career as overall. And we're going to go into, I don't, we'll call it the Cliff Notes version of from pre-high school through the end of college days. But growing up, did you have like a specific player my fans of the show we we know we we talk about Barry Sanders that's a if you're from Michigan that's obvious but th- did you have a favorite player growing up like that you know when it comes to just sports in general um I really I really did you know when when people ask about who are your role models in you know in sports or real, or real life you know what it, it was mom and dad you know dad was the boss mom was the uh, the glue that held everything together and And that's what I learned, you know, um, dad was one of them kind of gentlemen that, uh, said, don't let, don't make mama tell you twice. And that's kind of way I grew up. And then my parents allowed me to play sports, but they always made sure that sports is a privilege. 
you do your homework, you do your chores, you do the, you know, for us, you know, growing up Catholic, you, you help the, the priests, the nuns, the you go to the convent or the rectory and, and you, you help them move, you know, being a bigger kid, I was kind of the pack mule, and which I was happy to do it because that this is where we were raised. Dad, um, you know, said this must be done and you, you just got it done. So when it comes to, you know, role models and, and sports, I, I had mom and dad, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm just pretty good role models. Like you said, gave you the good core values from the beginning yes, and rightfully so. I mean, so we're, we're, well, of course we bring you on because we talk about the NFL and everything, but I believe fully that the league is full with talent. You, you, you have to have talents to make it to the league. Right. But the ones that can really go above and beyond and be able to have the success, they have the good core values and they have, or, or they go through others, you know, strifes in life and then they're able to overcome them, which builds them in their character. Um, I mean, let's talk about going from, you kind of alluded to high school. Well, I get to high school and I realized, well, I guess I'm this, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to play football, but then you ended up going on to college as well. Let's just give me the cliff notes version from high school, the college rate to rate before the draft process. You know, the cliff notes is for, for me, you know, they, they, we went to, I went to Kennedy high school and I played uh, the uh, freshman football and just absolutely loved it. A quick story about that. His name was Mr. Ron Martinez. He was a uh, freshman year. He was the running back and we split teams. And anyway, there was a situation where the offense got yelled at and Mr. Martinez took it personally and the play was going to be run over again. And this time it's a walkthrough at speed wise. Well, Mr. Martinez did not take appreciate getting, um, I should say, getting barked at. And he came pretty much full speed at me. He hit me right square in the chest. And this next thing that I hit was my bottom on the ground, my head back of my head on the, on the, the grass. And Mr. Martinez stuck his foot right on my chest and kept running. And coach, I, rightfully so, he says, boys, do it again, do it again, do it again. And I told Mr. Martinez, I said, Ron, I'm coming this time. And I told the offensive line that was in front of me, I said, young man, you better hit me because I'm going to hit Mr. Martinez as hard as I can. Anyway, Ryan came at me. He put his head down. I put my helmet underneath his chin, lifted him up, threw him on his back. And and all of a sudden, coach goes, now, gentlemen, that's the way you play football. Next play. And it literally, it, it introduced me to what football was truly about. Domination. And I just played uh, sophomore year, then my junior year, played varsity in my senior year. And then the opportunities came down for recruitment. I had an opportunity to either, you know, I run the country, but the two places where I had most of my heart into was University of Oregon and Washington State University. And then at the very moment, the last moment, I said, I want to stay in state, went to sign up for Washington State under coach Jim Walden. And I had four years of starting and it was absolutely wonderful. My first experience for Washington state as a red shirt freshman, it was all fifth year seniors going up offensive line. And all of a sudden the coach goes to the fifth year senior, get out, freshman, get in. And that was my first experience right then and there with, um, you know, what, what, what football is again, domination. If you dominate, you get a play. Yeah. And many different realms and everything is speaking of domination. So you, you had a very successful college career and I was looking back again at, so the, the draft process, (laughs) It was different back then as far as the hoopla that it is nowadays, of course. And I I mean, I I remember the presser when they introduced the different I, I shouldn't say I remember. I remember watching the replays of the presser because I was too young when it happened <laughs> when you guys were drafted. But what was the was it as much internally like the process? Like how, what was the process like? Let me just leave it there. OK, for me, you know, they, they said, you're going to go in the first round. You're going to go in the second round. You're going to go in the third round. Everybody had 
predictions all across the board. Um, for me, I chose uh, Bruce Allen and um, Ethan Locke as my, my attorney and sports attorney and uh, agent. And for me, I went down to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. They had a little get together and all that kind of stuff. The first round went, then the second round went, and then I'm sitting there going, holy smoke a roadies. And then um, third round, Detroit Lions called, and I got on the phone with Mr. Chuck Schmidt, and he goes, you know, son, we, you know, we're, we're drafting you. And uh, I said, by God, I'm, I'm ready to go. And that night, the, um, they flew me out. And that next morning, I had a press conference with uh, Barry Sanders, John Ford, myself, and was I out of my comfort zone, my good man? It was great, though. Yeah, I always wonder, like, so, I mean, going back and again, the talking about Lomas Brown talking in front of the entire stadium and then you with the TED Talks and your other uh, speaking engagements, I always wonder what that process, like, how do you prepare for something like that when normally you're behind a helmet and you just, all I got to do is I have my one job to hit this guy. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other factors that play involved, but then going into that comfort zone, I mean, were you comfortable speaking in front of people before you moved into that role or was it challenging? Speaking in front of people was devastating to me. I started as a kid and then over time I kind of grew out of it or worked with it. And, and the first few times you do these interviews and um, you have questions, you know, all sorts. And then you just work through it. You know, there, there's, you know, only one question have I ever considered a dumb question. And it was my very first question after my injury and so on and so forth. And in front of the international press corps, the gentleman says in front of everybody, right with that moment, how did you feel? And I said, shitty. <laughs> Next question. It's again, I've learned from Pee Wee High School, College, and through the pros, football, if you break it down, it's business. And I looked at it ever since as that's, that's what I did. That's not who I am. You, you know, you bring up a good, uh, I don't want I don't, maybe not point, but a good topic to bring up. So even for me starting the show, when I got into the interviewing realm, the first ever, I'm using air quotes here because it's a podcast. I get that. It's just audio only interview I ever did was I, I was at the Hall of Fame 2018 Hall of Fame induction class. This is the Ray Lewis, Brian Dawkins, Brian Erlock. I mean, we had this is a very, for my era, a very big class. And Ray Lewis is my favorite non Detroit Lions player of all time because I grew up at the era when he was a uh, linebacker for, you know what I mean. And I, I played <laughs> linebacker. So, hey, how do you not like that? But I just remember and this would have been one of those questions where Brian Dawkins looked at me and like he wanted to tell me that's the dumbest question I ever heard. But I said something like, oh, well, I can't remember verbatim, but something like what was the one play in practice that you would want your kids to remember? Like basically, like obviously he doesn't want to gloat about being in practice and making a good player. Right. So he, he did the professional thing. He digested it. He took it in and he said, you know, I'd want my teammates to talk about how I never took a playoff or something along those lines. So, yep. You know, that's, that's exactly right. You know, when it comes back to, you know, with the lions and that, that particular moment, again, uh, for me, back in 1989, when I was, you know, drafted, went through the training camp, earned the right, and all of a sudden, starting uh, that first week, the um, coach said, um, you know, all the you know starters get up there, and a gentleman stepped up, and all of a sudden, the coach goes, you know, get out, Utley, get in, that fast. Huh. And there it is again. And then all the way through, you know, through my first season, second. And then when Lomas did that on Thanksgiving Day, did that tribute. You know, I tell people, your position is earned. You have to be able to pay the price for what you want. Are you willing to sacrifice and do whatever it takes to be where you want to be? Nobody's ever given me anything. And, and, that's what I tell people, especially the young kids. You earn your right to be where you want to be. 
Yeah. And speaking of earning where you want to be, I mean, this is sidetrack and that wasn't Lomas Brown. He's, he's in the, uh, we'll call it the, the, the top 123, whatever it is for the hall of fame. And I'm not sure how, how far he'll make it, but I mean, I'm biased as a lions fan. So yes, yep. I'd like to see him <laughs> be in and everything. And you, you got to play with them for, was it, was he there already when you got yep. there? Yeah. He was left tackle for three years as I was there. You bet. Yeah, that must have been a very unique experience, again, with this camaraderie of just the, not the linemen and the team and everything, but as a fan, and it's easier for us as a fans to look at just the glamour and everything like that. But I Thanksgiving Day, of course, means something different to Detroit fans than it does to many other fans around the nation. But just thinking about like the chance of Barry, Barry, you know, in this, like, you know what I'm talking about, You're saying that big old green just popped up there. I mean, that energy in this in the silver dome too you know the historic silver dome it just must have been such a unique experience to play on thanksgiving day i would imagine i mean how many did you actually get to play on um not as many because of my injuries you know fifth game of the season then i broke my ribs i separated my shoulder separate hit my hip on in 90 and then i broke the um 11th game of the season i broke my neck you know and so my actually playing Thanksgiving day was, um, quite sparse to be honest with you. Yeah. You ever heard of Albert Einstein? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he the one that said you keep doing the same thing over and over and expect it? <laughs> Don't learn free mistakes. And my, my, my dad said, boy, if my poor kids, you ain't the brightest star in the sky. <laughs> and, just, and it's, you know, my parents, they've always asked, you know, my mom way back when, when it was Washington State, they saw how swollen I was, banged up, you know, the hands and, you know, limping a little bit, you know, back then. And and she goes, if if you want, you know, you can quit and we'll pay back Washington State for the, uh, you know, that scholarship that they gave you. I said, Ma, I, no, I, I want to play football. And then they moved on. And then when I was um, in uh, my senior year, we, we beat UCLA. And they looked at me and I just, my knees were swollen. My hip was, was just aching. And my mom goes, is it worth it? And I say, my, it's all worth it. And then one day after my injury, we're driving uh, with my dad. And I said, he goes, why do you, why do you play? I said, Dad, I play so I will always have five bucks in my pocket to get a beer and a burger. And he's driving a little bit longer. And, you know, I had, he, he had to load my wheelchair and I jumped into the car and all that. And, and then, you know, probably half an hour later, he goes, boy, you got, 20, you got five bucks in your pocket? I'm hungry. <laughs> and we went and had a burger and my parents have never said a thing, single thing about me getting hurt, anything like that. But um, it's because I chose to play and I chose the consequences of my actions. That's the one thing I want people to realize is if you choose to make a decision, then take care of the consequences that arise of your decision. Man up or woman up, you know, kind of thing, do what you got to do and then, but move forward. That's the ticket. You can't look back in a rear view mirror and then plan on to go forward. You can't, you got to remember your past, but you got to look forward to your future. I'm glad you brought up that, that very last point about remembering the past, because that's kind of my thing too, is I believe that, yeah, you don't want to dwell in the past and just sit there and live there. I mean, my DeLorean, we joke around, I can go back and forth with the 88 miles an hour, but yep. learning from the past. And like you said, you, 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 you made a decision, you made a commitment, positive outcomes or negative outcomes, whatever you want to say. If you look at it the right way, everything could be positive because you can go into a different path that you might not have even taken. And, you know, things things change. And we're going to get into the Mike Utley Foundation a little bit later on in this. But before we get there, I still want to kind of get into the little NFL thing. Like I said, Barry Sanders, as as you have heard, and everybody on this fan is probably Everybody listening to the show right now that is listening to this, they're like, oh, man, he's going to talk about Barry Sanders and the Lions again and how he was going to be Barry Sanders till he wasn't and all this stuff. But the other thing is the only coach I knew growing up, you know, because it's like so Wayne Fonts, is like, I didn't know another coach until was it 96, I think, when Bobby Ross took over. Same thing as Barry. I mean, what was it like playing for a coach Fonts? Oh, you know, it was one of those things. 
I've always had more of um, dictator coaches and they just told you what to do and, and you just did it. And I've never been, you know, my dad uh, growing up, you know, he, he will flat out and tell you, he's not your friend. He's your dad. This hand is going to give you everything you need, love and discipline. And that's what, exactly what a head coach was. And through all the way through, and then coach, uh, coach Fonts was, you know, boy, how's it, how you doing today? How you feeling today? Now he did that with everybody and it was a little bit different for me. So I was a little standoff, back office a little bit because I've never been used to that. And, you know, you tell them how you, you know, you tell them the truth and um, you, you just do what you got to do. But watching him through my three years and then how he responded, you know, when, you know, when I, as a rookie and then my, you know, injuries and I always, they always kept putting me back in. They kept putting me back in. I got hurt. I got rehab. I, they put me back in, got hurt, rehab, started again. And then I thought it was all over. And so Coach Fonts, you know, Mr. Ford and Mr. Chuck Schmidt, they believed in me. And that's what I look at. When Coach Fonts gave me that opportunity to start as a rookie, I, I told myself I would never let that man down. And I don't think I ever, ever have. Yeah, he, he's an individual that, of course, would, <laughs> this show checklist will call gold box. What is it called? Uh, how oh, geez, bucket list. I don't even can't even think of what it's called now. So let's just carry on and move on to this dumb question I'm about to ask that you just talked about. So I'm doing the research, right? And I'm looking through and, and, and like I said, I, I very vaguely remember the career being that I was so young, but I vividly remembered the thumbs up and I remembered that kind of moment. Uh, let's go to the photos I'm looking at as I'm going here and looking for Mike Utley. I see a 1992 Pacific football card with you on it. And I thought back, I'm like, man, I remember that season of those Pacific football cards. I'm pretty sure I have your card sitting somewhere in a box somewhere. And here's the dumb question, right? Like how, what, when you saw yourself on a card, that was pretty cool, right? <laughs> okay. I got a football card after I got hurt. <laughs> Get a load of that one. Now, you know, it's, um, you see the baseball cards and as a kid, you know, with the little, uh, bubble gum, you know, you got, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I just never thought of it. But then the, like you said, the first time I happened to be in a wheelchair and I said, you know what, that's still pretty cool. You know, and that's, um, that's a legacy. And hey, gentlemen, your job is to leave a hundred year legacy, but what, how that legacy comes true is by what you do today. And I'm proud of what I did as a rookie. I'm proud of what I did as a, you know, second year and even my third year. And every time since then, we all make mistakes. That's not the issue. But I, I, every day I try to strive to be better than I was the day before. And that's what life is. And being able to that moment, um, see something like that. I have to admit seeing your car, your, your mug on a car. It is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I would imagine. So, I mean, again, you don't want to be like going back to the Brian Dawkins questions, like, well, how am I supposed to answer that other than say, you know, but at, at, so you, you kind of transitioned there about what you do. And then uh, you almost said the questions you like you, so get back up. And I was again, reading through watching and I'm looking and I see the 1999 where the there was a press conference again. And, you know, so the first time where you got out of the chair and you so you took your first steps, they said, and uh, how do I ask this question without saying dumb again, but how does that feel? Right. Like <laughs> walk me through that process. Sure. Literally. Um, you know what <laughs> it is. It over, over time when I first got hurt, um, that, Nine days um, after I got hurt, nine days or um, I, it was back or 12 days back into um, uh, IC unit because I threw two blood clots and so on and so forth. So uh, I was, you know, that was devastating for another nine days. But then every single day I tried to strive to do something that I didn't do the day before. I had no hands, no wrists, no fingers. I couldn't feed myself, go to the bathroom myself, and so on. So every single day, I used what it took to be a pro to take every day a step forward, whatever it may have been. 
feeding myself, combing my hair, brushing my teeth, shaving. I took every single day I worked on my hands. And then over time, it got to a point where my triceps came back. Now, I still didn't have my hands much, but I was able to do some standing in a standing frame and so on and so forth. So from 91, when I got hurt, all the way until my um, stepping, I did biofeedback, weightlifting, conditioning, nutrition. And I put people around me that were motivators that pushed me, guys, gals. And it didn't matter. If someone was to the next level, I try to get on their coattails. And that's when 99 came up and I had an opportunity and it kind of blew up to be a kind of a big thing, international thing, which I had no idea they wanted to watch this uh, offensive lineman get up and take a few steps. Up until that particular day, I had a couple of gentlemen, um, Keith Klingenberg and Blair McKinney back up in Washington state uh, helping me walk and it, you know, it was absolutely phenomenal. And but this particular day, I had a couple of ball players, you know, they never, never stood with me and that kind of stuff. So it was a little harder than it, what it was with the other gentlemen. But I wanted to show people Mike Kelly was back, that I have not quit. And my goal is to walk off Ford Field, Silver Dome, but now Ford Field, and show people. You can have dreams, but you've got to live every day until those dreams are obtained. And that's how I feel like I still believe that every single day from those days stepping, even today, I just haven't done it yet today. I, I don't do clips of this show, but if I did, I would have, I would, I would, I would love to pull that clip out where you said you can have dreams, but you still got to live day to day because enjoy the moment and the process and the ride. And speaking of a dude, so I wrote this down. I wrote a whole bunch of notes to myself but like you seem like a very i don't want to use the word free spirit but like a very motivational you seem like a good dude let's just use that term and it just it was so funny in the moment and it was just priceless where if you remember the the video there was a phone ringing and you go dominoes oh. <laughs> i'm like you're in the middle of trying to go through this and you just you just have that great personality in the moment and i think people can can latch onto that and everything and you alluded to it so let's take that delorean again we're going to go back to 1992 now uh, the creation of the Mike Utley Foundation. I'd like to let you just kind of open riff. Let's the purpose of creating the foundation and what's kind of gone on over the past 30 years. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. And the originally started the Mike Utley Foundation because when I first got hurt, you know, people called, my parents called, and there was no really no place to go to say, you know what, here's some answers. Here's you know, we think the best places to go. And these are the things you need to do. This is the equipment you need to have um, and so on. And thank goodness I had a cousin that, um, or, you know, my mom, so his second or third cousin that was working at Craig Hospital and, and did the rehab and all that kind of stuff. So I, a month in Detroit, three and a half months in, in Craig Hospital, but we started the foundation for three reasons. Research, number one, because that's going to get most people out of these chairs and put therapists um, out, of, uh, out of business, so to speak. Number two was rehabilitation. Every single day as an athlete, it's a lifestyle. Rehab is a lifestyle. And I wanted to pass that on to non-athletes, you know, guys, gals, people who just didn't live the same style of life not better, not worse, just different than what I, I, my path. And then the third thing was education. You educate yourself about this position you are in to help educate others so you can always continuously move forward no matter what adverse situation you face. So number one is research, education, and uh, rehabilitation are those three facets of the Mike Utley Foundation. So this is something that I like to ask guests for various reasons. Uh, if you could go back to yourself, again, we use the DeLorean as, the, as the, the mode of transportation. But if you could go back to yourself, like right before starting the foundation and give yourself a piece of advice of something that you've learned over the course of the past almost 30 years running the foundation, what would you tell yourself? Oh, boy. Um 
I think hold doctors and researchers more accountable. Not that that people ever did anything tort towards the foundation or what people did with money, but I think I would have held more people verbally accountable for what they're doing and where they're going to go and make them say it publicly because then there's more public pressure to fulfill those obligations. And that's the one thing about being filmed, you know, as, as an athlete, and that's what I mean, kind of say, you know, make them say it publicly and, or even the patient, make them say it publicly, what they're going to do. If you, boy, if you say you're going to go skydive to your, 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 uh, your loved one, you better get up there and go skydiving or they're going to call you a sissy girl. You know, and these kind of things, you hold people accountable and it just kind of, I feel it snowballs in a productive way because now what, you know what, you put your name to it. Now let's get it done. It's an added, small little added push. I think it could have made a, a just difference back then. I think that's, yeah, I, I could, I could relate to that for many reasons. We could go Tony Robbins. We could talk about anybody that says, you know, put your, put your name to a goal and make it public. So then people will help hold you accountable. And the next question, one of them was going to be, you know, what advice would you give to someone that had unfortunately suffered this condition? And that would be one, but like if someone that suffered this condition or even a family member, what piece of advice would you give them? Okay. First of all, if it's for the family and loved ones and community, treat them just like they were before. My brothers put Christmas lights and Christmas balls on my halo when I during Christmas time. So they, I was a little brother, even though I was bigger. You know, they um, they treated me just like uh, like the little brother, which was totally totally cool back then. Um, I just I tell people, look in the mirror, like yourself, number one. And change those things you can change. And but hold yourself accountable. The next day you get up and look in the mirror, boy, hold yourself accountable. Young lady, hold yourself accountable. It's small wins become big mountains. You don't, you never climb the mountain, you know, uh, and say, I'm at the top of the mountain. It doesn't work like that. Athletes always, always monitor success and uh, goals achieved. That's the number one thing I can tell people. Set goals and then start setting them and start attaining them and one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And before you know it, your goals are met. And it's just, they're small wins. You do it in football, you do it in weightlifting, you do it in, in relationships with you know your girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever that may be. And that's the bottom line is set goals and go get them. Yeah, I appreciate you brought that up too from a perspective of a someone who hasn't gone through that type of injury because it's easy for some, I'm going to use myself as the example, right? So I have a, a friend at work that we have the same position and we work in the industry that's roofing. So physically he's not getting up on the roof unless we have some other types of things. And it's easy to to want to help because you're trying to do the right thing. But then also, like you said, they're, they're the, same, the same as they were before. You know, he, he, he suffered an injury in midlife. It was a snowboarding accident of some sorts. And, and then I've asked him some, these types of questions before too. And, you know, he, now he's dealing with the whole, his, his vehicle got struck and he's trying to find a new one, but it's trying to get the pedals. And now he's in the, you know, the, uh, the, the hand pedals and everything is just one of those things that you don't think about as someone that doesn't have to go through that, it's like, yeah, go buy a vehicle, just go get it. What are you doing? And, and then it's, no, I got to do with this. So I, again, I appreciate it. That's me ranting off in there, but uh, <laughs> uh, let's speaking of that. I know you're going to walk off of Ford's field, but what is the other event or activity, whatever you want to put to it, when you walk out of that chair, what else are you going to do besides what, when you walk out of Ford's field, where are you going? Oh, you know, um, where where am I going to go? You know, I think if it was up to my parents, straight to church. <laughs> um, you know, to be honest with you, it's something. If I had to pick something right now, it would just take my wife Danielle 
someplace. And she has been, you know, a phenomenal rock kind of thing. And I tell people, would I still be here? The answer is yes, I would. But the journey, as my dad said, not having you four kids um, was good. But having you four kids, we had a lot more fun. And it's just the way I look at it. We had a, we've had a lot of good ride for 20 years, been married, you know, 23 years together. And just doing something like that to repay her for, you know, the hard work and the sacrifice, which she has done. I think that's beautiful. And uh, speaking oh, of... Oh, don't quite get sappy on me, man. I did enough that sappiness for <laughs> both of us. So <laughs> next question, my good man. I am moving on to the next question because what I want to do, though, before we get into the final, we'll call it the overtime realm. Let's talk, if, if the listener of the show right now wants to learn more about the Mike Utley Foundation, where do they go if they want to learn more or even help out? Okay, number one is just go to mikeutley.org, Mike Utley Foundation, mikeutley.org, and it's they'll, they'll click you to the foundation, and and you'll be able to click on there, and, and Danielle, she gets all the emails, so people, she, she's been doing this for, for years. Anybody that emails, she always responds. If when one person gets hurt, family members respond. If it's an athlete, it's a coach, it's the administration, a teacher. And it's just people always want to help out. And Danny helps out at the very beginning. I help out after the fanfare is gone. Because now it's time to look in the mirror, pull your boots up by, you know, your pants up by, you know, the straps and, and get going. And that's a big ticket for me is to Danny will help you at the front. I help you on the backside when it's time to put the uh, rubber to the road, so to speak. All right. Speaking of put the rubber to the road, we're going to the whole where we're going. We don't need roads because we got this. We're in number two back to the future. But before we let you go, we got to have we got to ask you any last words of wisdom for the listener of the show. Number one, don't break your neck. It sucks. But, you know, my good man, you know what it is. Um, in 91, I broke my neck. In 2018, I had a spinal infection. Now I have what they call a corpectomy. T9, uh, T9, 10, 11 vertebra were completely destroyed. The four discs. I got a little gizmo that supports T8 to T12. Rods from L, uh, T5 to L4. Um, I got a zipper on my back, three quarters of my whole back. Um, folks, we all face adversity. It's your character. It's your legacy. What do you want by looking in the mirror and doing something today you didn't do yesterday? And the bottom line is make your last name mean something. There you go. Make your name mean something. And we got to admit, this was a personal for your host of the show, yours truly, a, uh, we'll say an occasion where it was pretty cool to be able to relive something with the player that I watched playing, although I don't vividly remember it. This moment was one of the ones that I personally remembered growing up that I can recall anyways, you know, the, the thumbs up. Unfortunately, it was not the moment you want to recall, but it is something that I can always look back on and say, yep, I do remember seeing that when I was a youngster. And then... We got to talk a little bit about some Detroit Lions history. We got to talk about some other things. But more importantly, personally, I think listening to the way that Mike did not let this injury that could have easily shattered his life and perspective, he said, no, I'm going to go after it. I'm going to take care of business. And ultimately, I'm going to end up walking out of this chair. So whenever you see him at that ticket, maybe when you're walking and driving down Woodward Avenue, you're going to maybe a Comerica Park game down the road. Don't run over Mike Utley when he's walking across the street. Now, next episode, we go way back in time to talk to football historian Bruce Smith. Not that Bruce Smith. About the beginnings of the league. We're going to talk about the Dayton Triangles and the first ever NFL game and a little bit more history about the Dayton Triangles and what they meant to the league during the formation and everything that happened during the first years. To make sure you get that episode as soon as it releases, 
don't forget to mash that little subscribe button or follow button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes well each and every week. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.